murder is, uh, the murder mystery continues to play itself out. On our uh, satellite from our, uh, st we are ready with the tape. Here's, here's what riveted Boston viewers on the nightly news the next night. Roll that tape. Can you give me any indication where you might be? Any building? Oh, no. Okay, is your wife being shot as well? Yes. In the head. In the head? Yeah, I got down. Is your wife breathing? Yeah, just here, it's just here, it's a big street up ahead. Oh, man, I'm blanking out. You can't blank out on me. I, I need you, man. I can't move. Oh, God. Where were you shot, Chucky? Chuck? Chuck, can you hear me, Chuck? I love I was. Chuck! Damn. Hey, wait a minute. You hear the sirens over there? You hear the siren. I can hear a siren. On the satellite from our uh, station in Boston, Channel 5, WCVB is the crime reporter for that station, Ron Golovin. Uh, Ron, uh, last week, the man whose voice we just heard jumped off a bridge in the greater Boston area and killed himself. That is to say, uh, the husband of the deceased woman, Charles Stewart. That it, is a presumption, Phil. We don't know, in fact, that he did jump. So we're all getting very, very careful now following massive misinformation offered by not only the media, but uh, the police department as well. I think the entire city of Boston, including the police and the press, were duped. Mm -hmm. um, Kindly explain for us the involvement of uh, Charles Stewart's brother, Matthew. Incidentally, Stewart, the deceased man whose body has been pulled from the Mystic, or from the, uh, from which river? Mystic River. The Mystic River. Uh, was, what, 29 years old? Uh, I believe that's correct, 29 or 30 years old. And his brother, Matthew, is, uh, 22? 22, 23. Uh-huh. The younger brother. And what has Matthew told the police? Matthew has told the police that on the night of the murder, his brother had asked him to meet him at a prearranged spot that he showed up in a car, his brother rolled down the window and passed to him a bag and drove away. And Matthew took it to his parents' home in Revere, opened them up, found a 38 revolver, he found Carol Stewart's jewelry, including her engagement ring, and he took the uh, purse and the gun and threw them in the river. Uh, it, it, both the purse and the gun have subsequently been recovered, is that so? That is correct. The purse was recovered first. The gun was recovered uh, last Tuesday afternoon. And how does uh, Matthew explain to the police his behavior on that uh, at that time? What did he think he was doing? My what did he think his brother was doing? Well, I think he thought that his brother was pulling an insurance scam, that his brother was a general manager of the Cacus Fur Company. And Matthew tells the police that he thought his brother was pulling a phony robbery. And he thought he was taking the receipt to the fur company home with him. He didn't know anything about the shooting. That's the story Matthew told police. So in order for the brother Matthew to be believed then, the transfer from Charles, the older brother, to his younger brother Matthew of the person, the gun, would have to have happened after his wife took two bullets in the skull and Charles took a bullet in the uh, abdomen. Am I, am I close? You're very close. In fact, she was only shot once in the head. And Matthew claims not to have noticed or had any information about a body next to his brother at the time the purse was handed over. He said he didn't see that his brother had been wounded. He said he didn't see his sister-in-law in the car. But he said it was dark. Does his brother, uh, does Matthew acknowledge that there was a dress rehearsal for this event at that same location 24 hours prior to the uh, shooting? Yes, he told police that Chuck showed him exactly where he wanted him to be, and they went through a dry run, if you will. Uh, but it is also true that Matthew is claiming to have no information about any shooting or murder or anything like that. The scam did not involve personal assault of any kind, in, as he understood it. Is this his story? That's his story, but uh, rumors of an earlier plot to kill Carol Stewart had surfaced, and Matthew was involved in that. Whether, in fact, it was a plot to kill Carol Stewart or just to burglarize the home, and for insurance purposes, we don't know. And uh, the attorney now representing Matthew appeared on CNN Live this afternoon to acknowledge that there was a disjointed conversation 
uh, with his brother prior to the murder, uh, something about insurance and uh, uh, very sketchy details, but, his, but it is the attorney's uh, contention that his client, Matthew, had wanted absolutely nothing to do with whatever it is his brother was rambling about. Summation of what was said. Well, it's very confusing, Phil. The, uh, Chuck is one of four brothers, and this was the attorney who was on, Richard Clayman, representing uh, Michael Stewart, who is a Revere firefighter. Now, interestingly, what he said was the attorney said that Michael Stewart had been contacted by his brother Chuck some weeks prior to the actual murder and was asked about a plot involving a homicide and which Michael said he didn't want any part of. Let, uh, it is also true that when uh, the police finally were able to talk with uh, the wounded Charles Stewart, he claimed that a black man what? He claimed that a black man had jumped in his car with a gun as they were leaving a childbirth class uh, in Boston and at gunpoint forced him to drive to a deserted area, robbed them, and then asked for Chuck Stewart's wallet. When Chuck said, I don't have a wallet, he looked down at the cellular phone and said, you're 5-0, uh, slang for police, like Hawaii 5-0. And then he said he heard his wife was shot. He, when he heard the shot, he ducked down, and then he was shot in the side. Uh, here is a piece of a report on the night of the murder. This is how Boston responded, uh, media and otherwise, to what was thought to be a on a white victim, including not only a married couple, but a pregnant uh, woman as well. Here is, uh, here is a, a reporter, uh, number two. Here is a reporter. And uh, as as he appeared, a uh, voiceover on the evening news in Boston. Roll the tape. Police say the gunman jumped into the couple's car, which was stopped at Huntington Avenue and Francis Street outside of Brigham and Women's Hospital, where the couple reportedly was attending a birthing class. Police say the gunman forced the couple to drive to Terror Street, where he allegedly robbed them of $100 cash and their watches. Police then say the couple was forced to drive to St. Alphonse Street at the Mission Hill Housing Project, where they were shot inside their car. This, uh, and all of Boston, uh, believed this story, including uh, Mayor Flynn, who visited the victim in the hospital, the child of the slain woman survives for 17 days after the shooting, only to die, uh, finally, following heroic efforts to save the baby's life. Here's the mayor shortly after this shooting. Angry Mayor Flynn, who visited the man and woman at the hospitals, is asking that every single available police detective in the city work on the case. Uh, it's a tragic uh, situation that uh, everybody's heart goes out to the family. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, an, it's another example of, uh, of uh, the availability of guns that, uh, that are so frequent. It uh, seems like it's happening every, do every single day. Uh, Ron, back to you in Boston. Uh, was there life insurance paid to Charles uh, uh, Stewart following the death of his wife? Yes, there was. The John Ken Hancock Insurance Company paid $82,000, $83,000, I forget which, to uh, Charles Stewart. He used that money to buy some jewelry and a brand new car just before he jumped off the bridge. And it was that's and, what happened. And did Charles Stewart ask to hold his dying baby prior to the uh, time that the baby expired? My understanding is there were two visits. At one point, the baby was taken to, they were in two different, different hospitals, and the baby was taken to Chuck Stewart uh, at Boston City Hospital, and then on the day the baby died, Charles Stewart went by ambulance to the Brigham and Women's Hospital and was there when the baby died. Is there another woman in this story, Ron? Well, there are reports of a beautiful blonde woman who... Uh, just issued a statement today, said that she knew Charles Stewart, she knew him as a friend and was not romantically involved, and she resented the implication that, in fact, she was a girlfriend. So now uh, we have a number of uh, Boston uh, uniform personnel and detectives going through black domiciles looking for the guy who they believe to be black and a cop hater as well. That's correct. Here, uh, now, this gets just to be a little more uh, emotional and uh, potentially incendiary with the following uh, news report. A taped message 
from the recovering Charles Stewart, read from his hospital bed, is played at his wife's funeral. Here's what Bostonians saw on the evening news. Good night, sweet wife, my love. God has called you to his hands. Not to take you away from me, all the happiness and gladness you brought, but to bring you away from the cruelty and violence that fills this world. Now you sleep away from me, I will never again know the feeling of your hand in mine. But I will always feel you, I miss you, and I love you. Your husband, Chuck. Louis Alisa, president of the Boston chapter of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, calling for the mayor to apologize to the African-American community. You say, among other things, that blacks are calling for reparations from the city for their civil rights being violated. Kindly make your case. For itself, on the night of the 23rd of October, the African American community in the city of Boston was put through a horrendous um, experience. The police were called out, and every African American in that city's life was put in jeopardy to a large extent because he said, We were going to find this killer. This killer is black. And he gave police fiat power to basically stop people, to break into people's homes, and to violate their constitutional and civil rights. We've asked the mayor to apologize to the African American community. He has apologized to Mission Hill. I think every African-American needs apology. We also ask the Mission Hill community to receive reparations. Mrs. Bennett, whose door is still not fixed, and other people whose property has been damaged should find reparations, and that community should have opportunity to heal itself. Uh, the uh, statement of Matthew, the surviving brother, who claims to have thought he was involved in an insurance scam with his brother, who subsequently committed suicide, we need a program for this story. Uh, is that he came forward when he realized that a black man had been fingered in a police lineup as the person responsible for this crime. So he is essentially saying, I didn't want to see an innocent guy of any color take the rap for this. I assume this is essentially what his thinking must be. This is speculation. I haven't talked to the guy. Uh, how, is it that, uh, how is it that a black man was uh, named as a, in a lineup as a person responsible for this? Well, I think the country set itself up after a summer of Willie Horton and another summer of 88 where we showed all negative images of black males in the media and drugs and guns in the inner city, and then the Central Park issue, and so the Charles Stewart saw what was going on in the city of Boston with the stop and frisk, and he said this community is right for this type of scenario, and he just called the cards. I think that uh, Chuck Stewart's brother, he didn't care about the black man, he didn't care about anyone. If he could go to the funeral and cry crocodile tears at his sister-in-law's death, knowing that he carried the weapon that killed her, I think he came for it because he heard the footsteps behind him. I think this man cares nothing about society or civilization. Robert George, attorney for the former uh, primary suspect, William Bennett. You say, among other things, that the police department knew all along that Chuck Stewart was a suspect. Can you prove that? Uh, that's not what I said, Phil. What I said was is that 75% of what we know now, which has come forward since Charles Stewart jumped off the Mystic Bridge last week, what could have been known to the police prior uh, to Chuck Stewart being discharged from the hospital and also could have been known prior to naming and leaking to the media that Willie Bennett or William Bennett was the prime suspect in this case. Uh, did, your, did your client not say, or isn't he uh, alleged to have said that he was responsible for the shooting? See, that's the misrepresentation that's being leaked to the media right now, and where those leaks are coming from, I don't know. He never that, did say anything like that. That is not the truth. What the truth is, and this has all been impounded, so it's hard to, to detail and talk about, especially on national TV, is that there's a nephew who was bragging to people that his uncle, who was William Bennett, had committed the crime, and that person has since come forward and said that he was only boasting for his friends. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is the media is being manipulated right now, and the public is being manipulated right now, into believing that a person like William Bennett is a likely prime suspect and right. somehow makes it better to blame an innocent man for a crime he didn't commit. And weighing against your client is the fact that he served time at Walpole. And once again, uh, a man's crim I've never pinned any medals on William Bennett. The fact is, is he has a criminal record, but it doesn't make any difference, at least from my position and from the defense position in the criminal whether a man has a criminal record or what race he is or who he is. The fact is he was innocent and he was about to be indicted for this crime. And so every black male becomes a potential suspect and a potential victim of certainly at the least the loss of his civil rights Anytime someone says, a black man did it, a black man did it. Every black male in the city of Boston became a potential victim, and a lot, over a thousand of them were. 
the bottom line was that the scenario for Willie, Willie Bennett was set up the second day of the incident when the police officer said that 5050, we're looking for a man who doesn't like authority and doesn't like police. All they had to do was throw in the computers and find out who'd had a run-in with the law, and they'd already narrowed it down to a few people by the fourth day. Let me show you some of the response of the citizens who lived in the neighborhood into which police went looking for the black guy who sh killed Carol Stewart and wounded her husband. Here is that commentary from the people in the neighborhood. Harassing all my friends and my family and stuff, that was ridiculous. I, anyway, I do feel that they're overreacting as far as going to people's house, knocking on their door, and taking them out. I mean, that's really uncalled for. She was right. She, that, that is the only reason. If it would have been a black family, that would have been mad. And they wouldn't, have, they wouldn't have been zooming here and there all going crazy if it was a black person. Yeah, they're getting kind of carried away, you know? Oh, yeah. I know a couple of people who got stopped before and hey, yeah. they didn't go about it. It wasn't even on the news. Day. Francis Mickey Roach, Commissioner Roach, the police commissioner of the city of Boston. Well, you're on the spot here, Commissioner, but you probably have been before. What do you what do you want to say here uh, at the top of this uh, discussion about a s considerable municipal agony that Boston finds itself in the middle of now? For several years, Mayor Flynn, Louis Elisa, as a leader for NAACP, and a lot of wonderful people who head up neighborhood groups have worked very hard to achieve some level of racial harmony. For seven years, I investigated racially motivated crimes. I saw the ugliest crimes that can be committed in society. I saw black people driven out of their home in public housing in Boston in 1978. I saw a family driven out of their home because somebody thought they were Puerto Rican. And it turns out they were Guatemalans or aliens. I saw young babies smashed in the face with sidewalk bricks. I saw Molotov cocktails being thrown at citizens. And those kind of issues bother me. I do not want to go back to those days. Right. We're not going to get, let, let, me, let me just make this point here and now. You know, we cannot be smug enough to suggest that this problem is Boston's alone. And isn't it time that we stand up and say out loud, just like the brave men that we are, Media does not chase black on black crime with the same enthusiasm that it chases white on black crime or white on white crime. The energy that the police department brings to the issue of black on black crime is certainly not as enthusiastic, vigorous, and filled with the kind of manpower that attended this case at the time that we thought a black man killed Carol Stewart. And to make my point that Boston is not alone with this problem. On the occasion of the assault of a white jogger in Central Park, allegedly by a group of black males, one of our most highly visible citizens by the name of Donald Trump spent a small percentage of his considerable wealth for a full-page ad in the New York Times and other newspapers saying he didn't want to understand these people. He wanted to execute them. No such ad was taken out on the occasion of the death of Yusuf Hawkins in Bensonhurst at the hand of white teenagers. So nobody will be smug enough to say, Boston, you've got problems and we don't. But you, isn't it important for us now, and you especially, municipal servants, and we believe you that you've investigated all kinds of crime, to step forward and say, we do have a double standard in this society, and if we don't acknowledge we've got it, we're never going to fix it. I will publicly state, and I have for five years, that this country here has a serious problem. We are afraid to face up to the race issue. We are absolutely afraid to do that. And perhaps this tragedy involving the Stewart family perhaps will be the catalyst for, this, for all of us to reflect upon how we really think. I would admit that. I have said it for many, many years. This is a righteous country. Can we also be honest and say to the media that they take some share in this responsibility also? And that are we going to be mad enough to step up to that? <laughs> oh, 
Also on our satellite from uh, Boston, Professor of Law, Harvard, Alan Dershowitz, as a man who cares uh, more and has spent a good deal of his life uh, ensuring that the uh, full power of the Constitution be extended to all of our citizens. And as a citizen of Boston, may I ask for your initial comments on this uh, what would otherwise, uh, on this movie of the week that wouldn't be believed if a writer came forward uh, to a producer with the idea. Mr. Dershowitz, sir. Well, Phil, I think you put your finger right on the problem. We clearly have a double standard of justice in this country that everybody in this country is guilty of. I hope that this case, though, will help put in public perspective some of the problems that law enforcement inflicts on our communities in general, and I like to have the opportunity to talk to the police commissioner even indirectly. How was a black man who was innocent picked out of a lineup without some coaching by the police or some coaching by prosecutors? Uh, what pressures were placed on the nephew to come forward and create the evidence of a false confession? Uh, how could this innocent man have come so close to being indicted, convicted, and in many parts of this country, executed for a crime that he didn't commit. What does this tell us about how many other people there must be today in prisons around the country who are victimized by these kinds of racial hoaxes? Because the message is very clear from Stewart. If you want to be innocent of a crime and you want to frame somebody, pick a black man, do it in a black neighborhood, people will fall for your ploy because it fits and feeds right into the stereotype the police will not vigorously investigate alternate suspects. They will violate the rights of suspects in the community to the degree where a conviction will be forthcoming. So this is only the tip of an iceberg, and I worry about what this says about the administration of justice in urban centers, particularly in racially divided centers, where there is an enormous amount of racism to go around. Uh, the Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Roach, commenting. Uh, Mr. Dershowitz, uh, I think we're more, I think we think a lot more than people think. For example, police officers reflect the rest of the human race. Well, we're no different than anybody else. We are no different. When a young police officer listens to a man who's almost mortally wounded, Charles Stewart, bleeding to death, and the young officer takes out that walkie-talkie, doing what he should do, and he's trying to obtain information and get it out to the troops so we can investigate. The description was deceiving. It was not a black male, but that's what we had. And I cannot comment on the lineup because I've tried to be very professional and stay with my code of ethics. The reason we're in difficulty today is because too many people said too much. The media, no problem with them. It's also one professional. We readily go down the wrong road. And we'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> Uh, for the police, who must feel very beleaguered now, and you do make a point, they are a reflection of our society, and should be, in terms of their makeup, we all ought to wonder whether attitudes uh, might uh, be examined more closely with police officers who, after all, carry a gun and are, have greater power to use it than does the private citizen. Mike Barnacle, co uh, columnist, the Boston Globe. Uh, before I share with you a brief section, a portion of the comments he made on the Today Show, uh, Ron, may I get back to you for a second? Would you, will you kindly, uh, let's see Ron, Boston. That's Mr. Dershowitz. There you are. Will you show me where the bullet entered Mr. Stewart's body, please? Can you, sh uh, what, what do you understand to be the pathology on this? My uh, understanding is the bullet went in here and traveled slightly downward, ending up over here, almost across his body. Now, so it, uh, the fact that he may have shot himself is believable. Well, I think there's some question about it. I have some questions. I think the doctors have some questions, and I think the police have some questions. Uh, and let's remind ourselves of his original story. He was shot by a black man who hijacked the car and held a gun on him from the back seat. That is correct. And one bullet entered the uh, rear of the cranium of his uh, pregnant wife and, I guess, uh, destroyed most of her head. Is that so? That is correct. It was a shot almost directly from the back of her head. Do we know the trajectory of that bullet? 
I don't, I don't know it. Maybe the commissioner does, but I don't know it. With, is it consistent with a story of a guy in the back seat? I don't mean to be such a headache for you, but again, I will not provide one iota of a comment relative to any part of this case. Mike Barnacle talking to Bryant Gumbel on the Today Show, a columnist for the Boston Globe. Here's what he said. The media has nothing to be defensive about, but more importantly, nor do the police. Chuck Stewart shot himself in the lower right hand uh, back and nearly died. Nearly died. That can't be emphasized enough. Everyone who spoke to him in the hospital, the police investigators, the doctors, the nurses, this man nearly died. Not the kind of thing that's going to happen yeah. when you want to survive. The other thing is he is so believable. I mean, here you have an absolutely demonic person who, having killed his wife, having killed his baby, asks to hold the dying child in his arms just prior to the child's death 17 days later. All the questions that were asked, there were no drugs. They did a, a drug run on his blood. They did a drug run on the wife's blood. They did a drug run on the baby's blood. They mm -hmm. asked Stuart in the car for a description. He gave them a description. They had an independent corroboration of the description. And the suspect himself, Willie Bennett, saying 24 hours later to his nephew that he had shot Stuart and his wife. Thursday, when Stuart comes out of the uh, ether in the hospital, he says things that the nephew of Willie Bennett had told the police yeah. on Tuesday, what do you expect the police to do? Go out to Wellesley or Lodge Martin and start looking for someone? You wanted to say, uh, Mr. George, as the attorney who represented Mr. Bennett, the uh, black uh, accused about whom Mr. Barnacle just spoke. This is the type of manipulation that we've been going through since October 23rd, except it's manipulation in reverse. Mike Barnacle has become a mouthpiece to defend the police and the system in this case, which is, which is almost silly because it's so narrow-minded. There was so much abuse in this case of the grand jury system, of the leaks, of the misrepresentation, of the misrepresentation that's coming out on comments like that, that it's, it, is almost, it is almost silly to even talk about it. Willie Bennett was innocent. The fact of the matter is the, the weight of the system geared up against him. It started very early. He's talking about things that the police could have known within days of Chuck Stewart being wheeled into that hospital room. The murder weapon was stolen from the safe where Chuck Stewart worked. I mean, these are the kinds of things. These are the kinds of, kinds of pieces of evidence that were sitting out there. Now, this man, or voices like Mike Barnacles, are now saying everything is all right, nothing was wrong. Well, that, that is just not true. And we can't get over these kinds of injustices. Now, Willie Bennett is an innocent man. It doesn't matter what race he is. Mr. Elisa believes race is a big factor in this, and it is a factor. But the fact of the matter is that an innocent man convicted for a crime he didn't commit, he was drawn and quartered in the press, and he was, manipu every he was manipulated as everyone in the public right. was manipulated. Now, and it's Mike Barnacle's being ma manipulated right now by his misinformation that he's getting from the Boston Police Department. I think it's the other way around. I think Mike Barnacle's manipulating the information to the police. I think people like Mike Barnacle, who are basically closet bigots, who for a long time created the atmosphere for a uh, for Chuck Stewart. He referred to the reverend, uh, the b uh, black uh, preachers who have spoken on this as loudmouth. Yeah, well, he, I read a reference that he made about the case, and I was brought up in that reference. Not only he's wrong, he lies in as he's been lying throughout the process. And that if he never had a question, if he, didn't, if he thought the case was so believable, it's because he had already created in his mind or prefabricated what he thought the African-American community in Boston would be like. And if someone shoots themselves in the lower right-hand corner of their back, there's something wrong about how you have to hold the gun in order to do that. And a rational, intelligent person, free of race and bigotry, would have thought to ask, what's wrong with this picture? And they never did. But to move so, beyond that, to move beyond that, the fact of the matter is, as Mr. Barnacle was saying, because of the type of person Willie Bennett is, and no one's pinning any medals on Willie Bennett, that it's all right to condone this kind of right. behavior. Yeah. Who, who's saying, who's calling for my attention? Phil, can you, I make a... Yes, briefly, Mr. Dershowitz, sir. An analogy between the well-known Tawana, Tawana Brawley case and this case. In both cases, there were frauds. In both cases, the public was misled. But think of the difference. In the Tawana Brawley case, they immediately called for grand jury investigations, and the complaining witnesses were brought before the grand jury, and there were no searches of those white people who were thought to be accused of having committed the crime comparable to the searches in the black community. Right. The inept person in this case, by the way, was not the police commissioner of Boston, who, by the way, is a wonderful man. It's the district attorney of Boston who was an inept, unprofessional prosecutor and who handled this case in a botched way from the very beginning. As soon as the suspicions began to emerge, there were suspicions. My wife and I were in the same hospital attending birthing classes 
at the same time as the Stewart. And the rumors were rampant there and among lawyers and among doctors. The first thing the DA should have done is called these people in front of the grand jury and made them lock in their story. Rumors. Then, rumors of what? About marital discord? No, no, no. There were rumors that were much, much more specific than that about difficulties of the wounds, about how the phone call could have continued. Oh, I see. The after the shooting. I, I beg your pardon. I didn't miss I didn't After mistake. the shooting, there I were see. rumors rampant right. that, this, that, that there was more to this story right. than the FBI. What? And the prosecutor didn't want to endanger his case against Bennett, because if he had called other people in front of the grand jury, he would have given fodder to the defense attorneys if Bennett ever went to trial to be able to say, aha, even the district attorney thinks there was another suspect in the case. So we focused on one suspect, went down the line, and didn't in any way attempt to uncover evidence against another suspect. Uh, just be, uh, with time running out, I'm coming back to you, uh, Gullivan. Uh, this is unfair, but let me just go over this again. I want to talk about Matthew one more time. Matthew acknowledges accepting from his brother as he sat in the driver's side of the car his a Mrs. Stewart's purse in which was uh, located a uh, 38 caliber revolver. Right so far? That's correct. In order to believe Matthew's story, we have to accept that Mrs. Stewart was at the... because the gun had already been used. Otherwise, there's no reason to give him the gun. Mrs. Correct. Stewart is slumped over the, dr the passenger side of the front seat with most of her head blown away. His brother has a bullet wound that has transected the abdomen with the bullet still inside his body, undoubtedly bleeding internally as well as externally, hands the purse with the gun to his little brother, 22-year-old Matthew, and Matthew said he didn't see Mrs. Stewart, he didn't see that body, and he had no indication that his brother was seriously wounded or wounded at all. Do I understand his story? I think you have it correct, Phil, but let's, let's understand that Charles Stewart fooled a lot of people, and I think it's certainly conceivable he could have fooled his brother. You don't think so? Not, it's not only is it not probable, but the question you have to ask, why is the person who's accessory before and after the fact of a major felony still walking the street? Why isn't that man in jail right now? And we'll, uh, we'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> Our program, as it uh, is being uh, broadcast, is live in Boston, and so we are able to... Um, at least uh, for, for the fleeting moments of our show, uh, entertain some observations from Boston citizenry. You are from Boston? That I am. You'll be brief, I'm sure. Go ahead. Yes, I'd just like to comment that I don't think that if, okay, if the same thing had happened and it was a black pregnant woman and her husband in the predominantly white neighborhood of South Boston, that Mayor Ray Flynn would have done the same thing. I think the same thing would have happened in a white neighborhood and doors would have been knocked down and I just don't think that they deserve an apology because I don't really think that Mayor Flynn did anything wrong. I think his decision was correct. Are you there? I'm glad you waited. Go ahead. Yeah, Phil, when I first called, I was boiling mad, and I was going to tell you that this is not a racist thing, and I, and I, I was sick of being called a racist, but now I, I don't know. Now they're starting to convince me that, listen, I am a racist. I, I'm from Boston. I... I I, I mean, I, I don't think bad things about black people, and I didn't characterize it as a racist crime. I mean, why is this a racist crime, you know? I mean, these guys on the, on the police department, they didn't know that the man was white that was calling when they rushed to rescue him. It was just dramatic, very dramatic, and that's why I thought it got a lot of play. But uh, now, I don't know. Now I'm being confused by listening to all of this. I'm glad you called. Are you there? Go ahead, Boston. Yes, I am. I think that we're giving a lot of rationalization to a man that was clearly irrational in what he did. And I have a real problem with the race issue becoming the primary issue in this case. There's a, a lot of other things that were very bizarre that need to be addressed. And it's just been um, a reason for a lot of people to get involved once again in a race issue where I think there's some more important things to discuss here. Uh-huh. You don't, uh, you're upset at the racial hook on this story. Um, I think that, um, I don't think that he, he spent that much time defining who he was going to choose. If, if you want to discuss it now, I have to say in all honesty, whether we like it or not, it is more easily believed that, that a black man would have done this only because... And that's racism. And that's racism. The fact that it's more easily believed that a black man had done it 
is racism because when you have a situation, you've been built up to believe what you've seen through the media, what you've heard constantly, what you get to see in the newspaper all the time. That's where racism comes. It's not that anyone is especially free from racism, but unfortunately this society has been uh, sensitized and oversensitized to the issue of race to the point we don't believe anything that's credible coming out of the African American community. Only negative things we're willing to accept. So when the newspapers and the police knew about issues uh, concerning the Stuarts that would make them suspect, they discounted out of hand. Ask Ron Golliman why they didn't follow the leads that they had gotten. Yeah. Are you there, Carl? Hey, today, let me just do this uh, one more time. I don't, I don't want to be a hot dog here, but let's try and make a point here. This is not funny. I, uh, uh, pretend you're watching the evening news, all right? Pretend you're watching the evening news. Huh? What, what color am I? What color am I? <laughs> oh, is the point made? Yeah. Huh? Yes, point is made. That's all we see. But still, that's still, all we see. There's a lot of people who are embarrassed, Phil. If they put a lot of people put mirrors up to themselves in this case, they're embarrassed that they believe Willie Bennett was so guilty just based on what they were reading and hearing and what was being leaked to them. And I think that's what you're hearing a lot of in those phone calls. Are you there, caller? Go ahead. I am. Uh, this is more than a problem of the Boston black community. I live 45 miles west of Boston. I'm a black citizen of the state of Massachusetts, and my family has also been affected by this horrible crime. My 14-year-old daughter is now talking about white people. She's calling them names like crackers and snow and all these other things like that. I don't teach that in my family. But I'm also very angry about what happened. There are many, many victims to this crime. It's the police, the media, the black community, and most importantly, Willie Bennett and his family. And I do think, as a black citizen of this country, we do deserve an apology. We definitely deserve an apology. And I don't want to see Mayor Flynn going around in circles. I want an apology for everybody because I don't want my daughter growing up hating white people. And we'll be back in just a moment. I come from the town where Tawana Borley incident took place. And the, the racial tension that's been created conversely to this still exists in our high school. Yes. Um, just before we had the newspapers, um, you were putting them down. It sells newspaper, gets rating right points, and uh, circulation. Yes. Yeah. I want to say I think it's true that the police department owes an apology to the black community, but I think that the media needs to know that they also deserve to give them one. Because they're to blame. Most of it. Why hasn't the white lady been interrogated, the supposed girlfriend? I think she has. She has. Yes. I'd like to ask Ma uh, Com Commissioner Flynn, why isn't Matthew... Uh, uh, Mayor Flynn, and Mayor this is Flynn. Commissioner Roach. Yes. Okay, um, I'd like to ask him why uh, Matthew isn't in custody. I... I try to be professional. The Suffolk County District Attorney, by statute law, is the, has the authority to use the law enforcement resources to coordinate the investigation. I will not be able to go beyond Does, that. Does uh, Attorney at Law Dershowitz have any commentary? Yeah, let me talk about that. You know, this case is about race, but it's also about due process. And it was wrong for the white community to push to put Bennett in jail and convict him if he was innocent, but it is equally wrong for the black community to be pushing for the incarceration of the Bennett brothers without due process of law. Now, there now, is the, a statute now, on the, the white books. community didn't push for Bennett to be put in jail. The white community didn't create the description. The member of the police, the Boston Police Department, created the description. Uh, Newman Flanagan failed to do his job. The black community has you're the right to ask point. why. You're asking my point. It has, you're my it point. has the my right point. to ask why this man's right is being protected when the African American right. community's rights wasn't. They took the kid out no, of Bennett's no, no, house. Not what we had nothing asking. to do with the case and took no. him down to the jail. That's not what you're asking. You're asking for an equal denial of due process against a white man because not. a black you're, man you're is denied due process. Are you aware, for example, of the existence of Wait a minute, make your, ask your question, Mr. Lisa. Uh, I'm, I'm asking why a person who's accessory before and after the fact by his own admission is still walking around free. Well, a woman who they have absolutely no facts on, who admitted to nothing, is incarcerated or was held in continuous incarceration. That's because all. there's a statute on the books, a, uh, a unique is Massachusetts a white statute. People? No, 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 it's for all people, and it says well, that if you're a blood relative 
of a person who committed a crime, you cannot be charged with being an accessory after the fact. Read the statute. Know the law. Due process applies to everybody regardless of color. If That's you're a what blood, this case is about. If you're a blood relative and you know that your brother knocked off somebody in a bowling alley, the cops can't get you for not That's reporting that? That's not only can't they get you for not reporting it, they can't get you for helping dispose of the evidence. They can't get you for helping dispose well, of the body. Well, why why wouldn't you bring your but it's on the law. Why wouldn't I'm you bring the... your considerable influence to the business of challenging the constitutionality of this law? Because you can't challenge the constitutionality of a law which will then be applied retroactively to a defendant who may have benefited under the law. There are constitutional issues both ways. It's a ridiculous statute, and I'll tell you, I'm going to use whatever influence I have to see it repealed, because it makes no sense. Why was Willie Bennett's nephew taken down to the jail and interrogated and held without bail? He was denied due process. I'm okay, with you. Fine. I'm with you when you argue against denial of due process, but I'm not with you when you call for equally abusive treatment on the other side of the scale. That's not the way to solve this problem. Well, let, me, let me apologize. I want them to be abusive in the process, but I want to be clear. I have no real indication that Bennett ever, uh, that Stewart ever pulled the gun on himself and ever pulled the gun on his wife. There's some great questions in, in which the media, as well as the police and the district attorney, has to answer. Because I think we may have a little bit more than just accessory, and we should look at that in a more clear and, and uh, accurate way. Over here, please. I agree. What justification is there for the media to identify before the crime has been investigated that the crime was committed black on white or white on black? What That's difference the does it make? Testimony of the victim. What difference does it make? You're trying them in the public and not in the court. We shouldn't reveal the color then of the person. Absolutely not. And we'll be back in just a moment. Okay, I just want to say that I feel really embarrassed that I was so easily duped by it, and I think it's a reflection on the whole country that we all better take a second look. Yes, ma'am. The solution to this problem is, excuse me, is our children. Please help us, Lewis. Teach our children to be better aware. Yes. yes. I'm a little, I'm fed up with comments like, all we see is negative, negative images. We need to look for the positive and teach our children to look for the positive. Yes. Yes. Okay, there seems to be a lot of blame being thrown around here, but the only one who really deserves blame is Stuart himself. Uh-huh. Uh, are you, are you uh, certain that Stuart was the uh, person who pulled the trigger? Yes. As a white person in society, I can say that racism and prejudice still greatly exist, and until everyone owns up to that, we're not never going to be able to solve the problem. Yes, ma'am. I want to know when this country is going to wake up, and I also agree with the gentleman from the NAACP. Why isn't the brother... Uh, in a, under arrest. Why Charles Stewart? Why, did, why do you think he pulled the trigger? Not to align myself with any one side, but I'll tell you this. Matthew Stewart deserves not to be drawn and courted in the press the way Willie Bennett was. That's Mr. Dershowitz's point. Let's not get the posse mounted, all right? Um, I'm still confused about the police order to enter the houses. Was it, were they suspects, or was it any house they wanted to enter? I would like to... Any house in the black community, any person they wanted to stop, over 200 stops a day were made of black males in that community, irrespective of their constitution and civil rights. So I have to respond, uh, ma'am, to this day, since October 23rd, I have not received one complaint relative to an invasion of a person's home or an illegal stop. Could we have made mistakes that night? I bet we did. I bet we did. But please, come forward if you have a complaint. Right. Yes, I didn't know which houses to choose, were there warrants or anything of that Were sort? warrants issued? Absolutely not. Basically, they blanketed the Mission Hill area and went into whatever house they felt the suspect. I think um, Stewart's brother had a lot bigger part in this. Well, you thing. better stop popping off. You may be the next one somebody talks about on national television. Yes. Uh, I don't think this problem of racism begins with the media. I think it all begins in the house at home and as you grow up older. It's it's just like charity begins to spread. And I think that we have a responsibility to all of our citizens in this country to have a nation where we start thinking of each other as human beings and start leaving these negative images and stereotypes behind. And the media plays a major part. In that and we'll, as well as that we'll be back in just a moment. Two one two 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 seven R E A D. Are you there, caller? I don't have a lot of time. Go ahead. The black community an apology. The only people who deserve an apology here is Carol Stewart. She is the victim. Yes. 
So, Commissioner, um, I wonder, if it was a part of your family, your daughter, your wife, who got murdered by a black man, would you still feel the same? Because you seem to be very uh, up on equality and everything. I wonder if you would Service still feel the same. Service is provided and promotional fees paid by the following. Yes. New Lipton Lotion Noodles. Hearty Instant Orient. Weekend. Price, the only Swiss hotel on Park Avenue. For reservations, call 800 Drake New York or 212 421 0900. Yes. Okay, I have no doubt that there's racism in this country, but this case is not a case of racism. I